the region. What we are going to discuss is the challenges uh, of uh, the ISPs under DDoS attacks. The speaker is the Junior Corasa, a network uh, and infrastructure analyst with more than 18 years' experience uh, in security and corporate networks. He is CTO and founder of Telic Technologies, a company that works uh, in mitigating anti-DDoS uh, attacks and providing support to ISPs in Latin America. A round of applause for Junior. Buenos días a todos. Mi, mi nombre es Junior Coraza. Voy a intentar hablar todo en español. I will try to make my presentation in Spanish. Oh, I have to do it in Portuguese. Okay. I'm Junior Coraza. I'm from Telic. So my the purpose of my presentation is to tell all providers what they have to do when we are in a scenario of DDoS attack. Now, more than what to do when you're under attack is what to do now while you're still not prior to the DDoS attack. When you are under attack, many things will occur. So it might occur that you don't have time to apply the best practices stated by the market or what the network requires. Now, internet and how this works. We are all aware that internet networks as a set of IT networks divided all over the regions in the planet and can exchange data and messages using a common protocol. So this provides the required connectivity between networks. So all the types of devices are therefore connected to the internet. We just heard in the last presentation that many devices are already connected to the IT. So what is a DDoS attack? A DDoS attack is a cyber attack, that a type of cyber attacks that seeks to render unavailable any service in a network. The DDoS attack does not seek to steal data compared to ransomware. So DDoS attack does not have the intention of data theft or producing a data leak based on that type of attack. Basically, the intention of a DDoS attack is to interrupt the availability of IT resources. So let us see why later on. Now, in Brazil, for example, we call these like the gangs that go into a mall, and many of these people don't want to buy. They just go into the mall just to to disrupt the, uh, the, the environment. So you might have just more people at a given moment, because these are gangs that go into the malls to to behave badly. So people who are already buying in the mall are interrupted in their process. So it's more or less like that. In a DDoS attack, you have so many packets that were not required by the network and are now entering that network. So all the normal type of accesses to the network are affected and become scarce. Therefore, this affects the capacity to browse of the end user. This here is a link that shows how this occurred in Sao Paulo. This is an example of how these situations occur in Sao Paulo. For example, as I was saying, you go to a mall, and these are gangs of young people that can be compared to a disotaka. During a DDoS attack, everyone is victim. It's not 
the only person that's not a victim is the one who sent out this DDoS attack. All the devices connected to the internet cameras, servers, all the IoT devices have a software. And this software is hardly ever updated. As a result, m malware takes over that software and creates zombies, what we call zombies. In other words, a large number of infected devices that are under this attack. This is more or less how this works. Here we have all the infected devices and also over here. So the attacker sends the attack command to some of the infected devices. And these devices send this to all the other devices in order to attack these victims. As a result, the attacker is not so easily identified. In Brazil, the way you can detect an attacker ends up being doing done by social engineering and not through technological options nor understanding from where the attack came from. So the person who sends out malicious attack is also a victim. It's normally a software, it's not an individual that was infected by the attacker that then created an army of botnets, an army of, sop, of um, botnets that are only used to attack and affect this network. So the most frequent types of attacks are amplification and reflection attacks. This is the most common type of DDoS attack. The attacker creates a packet with a false origin and is then forwarded This is forwarded to one of these botnets over here. And these botnets then forward this to the false IP. And this is where the spoofing occurs. This is the first solution for GDOS attacks. This is anti-spoofing. If all the providers would have anti-spoofing in their networks, then the DDoS attacks would be reduced 80 or 70%. If you allow an IP that is not from your network to enter, you are preventing this DDoS attack. This is the first solution to mitigate most of the DDoS attack. We must recall that the victim is not in charge of doing this. The one, those who receive the DDoS attack cannot be in charge of that, but this can be done by the provider behind all this. However, all of us are victims, and all of us are part of that ecosystem. Then we have another type of DDoS attack. We have the carpet bomb, which uses amplification and reflection as a technique. But it attacks a large amount of an IP slash 32 in the network and over a shorter period of time. So all the slash 20, 21s, and 22 at the same time are affected by this over a shorter period of time. So, in other words, the traffic during a traffic bond is so small, the traffic going to an IP32 slash 32 group is not, it is not detected by conventional, conventional tools. Therefore, if we have 10 or 15,000 clients in a network and increase one mega per second, which is quite a low volume of traffic in IP slash 32, then we have more gigabits per second in the network that strongly affects this network. A third type of DDoS attack is hit and run. This also uses amplification and reflection techniques. But it enters with a major attack. In other words, it stays there for 10 to 20 seconds. So the 
attack begins, you are flooded by packets in the network, and that flooding is there for, for 15 seconds. So the mitigation system cannot start to counteract, and you therefore have collateral effects. If the attacker does every 10 minutes, then you, your network freezes for, and therefore, the end users have a poor browsing experience. Some devices might even restart because they don't support the amount of packets that go through. This has nothing to do with the bandwidth. This is more about the number of packets that produce this impact. The major attacks, DDoS attacks, in were the following in 2021, Azure. Microsoft registered a DDoS attack to a customer in its cloud structure in Asia with a volume of 2.47 terabits per second and a speed of 340 meg Mbps. Is Google in 2027 dealt with a major attack to the network. This attack was addressed to the cloud services. Then we have AWS in 2020. Google also faced a major attack of 2.54 TBPS. Second, this was also addressed to the cloud services, Myriad in 2016, a further attack that had the objective a DNS provider called DIN and had a 1.5 TB per second. And then we have the GitHub DDoS attack in 2018, which is the development platform that was subject to a DDoS attack for several days. So this was carried out for political reasons, and it was centered on two specific GitHub projects created to avoid censorship by China. So what we can see and this is one of the examples, were rooted on political or geopolitical reasons. This is something that we see quite well in the war in Ukraine. These are the most common vectors used for DDoS attacks. We have DNS. We already have a serious problem here, because if you have a DNS type of attack, how can we mitigate this? without affecting the clean traffic. <clears throat> so what are the difficulties you have to mitigate attacks such as these? This is quite a major issue, because if you don't have DNS, you don't have internet. So this is one of the main challenges we have. And this is precisely one of the types of attacks that are more frequent. In addition to that, we have NTP, SNMP, UDP fragment, memcached, TCP SYN, TCP ACK. Now we have a new one. Then, which is CLDAP, NetBIOS, ICMP, charge N, UDP high pods, where the attacker sends a lot of traffic with a random origin and destination port, and this makes mitigation very difficult. The same happens with high CP, with high ports, and also UDP with port zero. IPv6 attacks and the legend. Now, why am I referring to this as a legend? Many people say, are there no attacks in IPv6? And the answer is yes, there are. But these are extremely rare. But nevertheless, they do exist. Now, why does this occur? The first point is that if you have IPv6 in your network, it is properly configured and working properly, then the collateral effect of an attack will be much smaller. Therefore, the collateral effect will be lesser when IPv6 has been properly implemented in the network. So here we can highlight a further item regarding the relevance of IPv6. Let us assume that you received an attack, an attacker spent money and 
forwarded an attack. What can you do to mitigate this DDoS attack? You can simply remove your IPv6 from the internet. That's the most straightforward way to do so, but it's not correct to stop announcing your IPv6 in the network. Therefore, many of the things that are done to mitigate these attacks require the use of some issues that are not necessarily best practices, but no longer using IPv6 in the network is a simple way to mitigate these attacks. Of course, in the case of IPv4, this also occurs. And in IPv6, you can do mitigation that way. This is a very simple type of attack to be mitigated. Normally, botnets don't have IPv6. This, of course, will stop to be the case once they will have IPv6, and they will no longer be able to say, stop announcing IPv6 and only mitigate. So having bot IPv6 botnets is quite rare. The volume of this type of attack is much small in these cases. So for a botnet to find a slash 32 network is very difficult and complex because there are very many IPs. This brings about many problems to the attacker. It is very expensive to attack an IPv6. That is why, as I mentioned, with everything that we mentioned, it makes no sense for an attacker to uh, attack IPv6. Let's see, during the attack, essentially the attacks will be in layers 4 and 7. Uh, are there attacks of layer 1? No, but in layer and layer two, yes, but it's extremely rare. Usually, the attacks occur between uh, the layers uh, four and seven of the RC model. So usually, they are exploring ports. The attack may come from anywhere, from uh, in the world, from Asia, from uh, the America, from the United, from Brazil. Now, uh, the fact of where the attack is coming from is important when. Uh, you want to mitigate. You need to know where the attack is heading. The, so the origin of the attack and the way it's distributed is uh, very difficult to be able to use because it's difficult to block uh, on the basis of geolocation. So it doesn't make such a difference. Now, during an attack, it doesn't make absolute. It makes absolutely no sense to limit the bandwidth of uh, the IP attack. So. If you go uh, if leave a, a specific port only one giga in uh, your network, still you are receiving that giga, and your router needs to process all that to uh, uh, put a limit in the bandwidth of what you need. So doing this, limiting the bandwidth, is not an effective mitigation. And, and nor does it make any sense to use the attacked IP. So if you say that you were attacked uh, five IPs in your network and that they are all uh, against uh, one uh, uh, client, uh, uh, tearing down that uh, with a, uh, uh, that uh, single client doesn't make any sense because the attack will continue to come unless you use a black hole, something that is no longer so popular today, nor is it so good to mitigate DD DOS attacks is no longer a viable solution. So the rules of firewall won't have the um, uh, results expected, especially when they have microchips. As everything is processed uh, in the CPU, probably you'll have a very big problem with your router. So the firewall rules won't have the uh, effects expected when you have microchips. And uh, when you, if you limit the blockade and you have a port with 10 gigas of transit and we are receiving a 100 uh, gig attack, your ports with their upstreams will be flooded with traffic. So it doesn't make sense unless you have traffic that can enables you to absorb all this and you suffer a 100 giga attack. If you have 10 gigas of normal traffic in your uh, network, you need to have 110 gigas of bandwidth overall to, for, to uh, as a matter of fact, be able to mitigate that. Your upstream is not mandatory. Uh, you shouldn't use it to mitigate the attacks necessarily. So if you buy IP transit from an operator, it is not mandatory to mitigate the attacks. Many of our customers come and say, well, we are being attacked. My, I, my, my, my transit, the attack is coming from the EXP. 
Don't you have to mitigate it? No, because you have to protect your networks. Nobody else will do it for you. In Brazil, it's uh, very common that when we have a DDoS attack, if you are an autonomous system and uh, that uh, DDoS attack is impacting your network upstream, in Brazil, it's very common for the upstream to just uh, uh, stop announcing it in the internet, to turn it off. Because in addition to having a negative impact in your infrastructure, it's also affecting 30, 40, 50 different upstreams. Your microtick will suffer, yes. If you have a microtick, it will suffer. There are no microticks uh, that are DDoS proof. Um, in many cases, you will receive a huge amount uh, and uh, microtick blocks it, and you'll have to go and physically turn it on again because it will suffer. So uh, DDoS attacks and microtick don't uh, get along well. The only uh, way out is mitigation, and it is hiring a mitigation. So where do we? Uh, do, where do attacks come from? Well, the first DDoS attack was uh, recorded in 1996. And with the increase of access, that also increased. So we have, a total, in 2023, we have 15.4 million DDoS attacks all over the world. And at present, an attack with 100 gigas can be bought in the internet for merely $100. You can attack a provider for one month with 100 gigas with just $100. So in many cases, where, where do attacks come from? From China, United States, South Korea, Russia, India. But there are different places where the attacks come from. Now, most of them come from these countries. And what's the problem here? I'm going to block, am I going to block all the traffic from these countries, China, United States, uh, South Korea? Uh, well, many things in Latin America depend on the United States to work, and if they don't have it, your users just can't uh, navigate in the Internet. Here you have some websites where you can see a real-time attack, a map that shows the countries the attacks come from. So what is DDoS attack mitigation? Basically, when you receive a DDoS attack, we are announcing, we are sending all the traffic through the mitigation tunnel that is usually in the cloud, and that enters uh, mitigation, and it cleans uh, all the attack and delivers a clean uh, traffic to the interface that you are connected to. That's very simple. Of course, uh, many techniques are used for that, but basically, if you receive a DDoS attack, you will have to redirect it to the mitigation cloud, and they are responsible for mitigating these attacks. And even more important, mitigating means simplifying, weakening, mitigating won't solve all the problems, but it's going to make life easier 99%. So usually we use uh, some of these tools to mitigate DDoS attacks. Uh, these are boxes, but in our mitigation, we don't use any of these. All our mitigation techniques are done by ourselves. We create the tools. And how does mitigation work? Well, basically, the Internet traffic enters the edge routers. It goes through the malicious uh, traffic through through these filters and is delivered here as a clean traffic to the access router where the clients connect. So this is basically the network topology in most mitigations. So do we have to hire a mitigation and everything will be solved? No. We will have to develop best practices, good practices. Your own re uh, recursive DNS with hyperlocal. This needs uh, you need to have this in your network. It's no good to try to mitigate an attack because usually we have a D DNS of uh, Google Cloudflare or public ones. You have to adopt a uh, um, massive uh, IPv6 in uh, your network. Do not use microtick. No way. I said three times in. I gave this presentation three times at different places, and I told people do not use microtick because even with uh, mitigation, you'll suffer. Always use private IPs for BGP connections with your upstreams. And why am I saying this? If your upstreams receive a DDoS attack and you are using a public IP, 
for to close the BGP uh, connection if the attack was, is, was in that when the way your uh, um, machines are connected, you will suffer the attack. And if you don't mitigate it, there will be a serious problem in the network, especially if you have migratic. So how do we um, do with this? Uh, uh, do away with this? Well, you need to do it in private IP. It may be a public uh, IP, but not in Brazil. Um, in, in, in Brazil, many people don't like to use uh, private IPs, but usually they leave a slash 22 or slash 20 of all the IPs they have to put this um, uh, BGP point to point, point, and they don't publish it. They don't make it public in the internet. So these IPs cannot uh, suffer DDoS attacks. So, in the backbone, always use a uh, point of entry that is private. Even if you have r good routers, uh, routers that uh, are good for routing packets. In Brazil, they, we use this a lot. And in Latin America, we use a, a switch for, to do an MPLS. And now what happens? These switch, switches, these uh, machines, are, these devices are good to do the pass-through of the traffic, and not receiving this traffic has a problem. I'm going to try to move a little faster, but never work within the limits of your uh, uh, machines, uh, can't hire, uh, don't, don't try to uh, uh, say that uh, you are under a DDoS attack. Uh, eliminate all the static loops in your network. Eliminate all the static uh, loops in and have a good uh, flow software. Good practices uh, with regard to microtech, if you're still using it, do not use firewall filters. Use uh, the maximum for CGNAT. Avoid using microtech in edge positions or BNG. Activate the fast track. And if possible, adjust uh, it for the fast track and use uh, as uh, little of the CPU as possible. Other good practices for mitigation is do not hire mitigation when you are going to suffer the attacks. Do it before. Don't ask for quotations to several companies at the same time, because there's always a company that offers bursts and uh, a plus uh, percentile uh, 95. We offer um, use uh, companies that are recommended by people you know and have multiple paths for mitigation and be careful with the amount of illicit traffic. And and why do we suffer DDoS attacks? Well, very often it is because of anti-competitive uh, act. If you have competitors, that's what happens. Our competitors may send attacks uh, to uh, tear us down. And there may also be criminals asking uh, for ransoms, and they attack us, so we will uh, um, uh, quit uh, operating, and they're going to ask for a ransom. And then, in the case of gaming, for instance, and then we have very quick uh, questions. If my upstream is being attacked and uh, I'm not, uh, am I going to be affected? Yes, you are. Why is mitigation more expensive than the IP trusted? Because it's more uh, because you have to clean the attack. I have flow spec in my trunk red. Do I need mitigation? Yes, not even all the attacks are uh, mitigated with flow spec, or less than half probably could be mitigated with flow spec at present. Now, if I, why do I continue to see an increase in traffic when I send my prefixes for mitigation? Well, you can do it when you are suffering some impact. Do I have to report to police that I'm being attacked? Yes. Who attacks me? Well, it's very difficult to know. As I said, the fact that you can finding this out requires social engineering. How long does an attack last? It may be 10 seconds or one year. We've already had clients that suffered attacks for six months nonstop. How long does mitigation, uh, or does it take for it to have an effect? Well, it depends. Some uh, mitigation start to be effective in 10 seconds, and uh, your traffic is already clean. Thank you. Well, I managed to complete my presentation at the right time. Tomas was telling me five minutes, five minutes. So if you have any doubts, please, you can uh, contact me. I'm at your disposal.
we do have time for a question. Hello. Well, congratulations, Junior, for your presentation. That was extremely interesting, all the set of good practices that you shared. I would also like to ask one in particular, because most of your presentation, you focused it on DDoS attacks of high rate, high throughput that in flood the network. Could you tell us if you have developed, with all your experience, uh, techniques for mitigating DDoS attacks, uh, slow rate uh, DDoS attacks that may also have a, a great impact on the performance of a network or a server in particular. I mean, uh, if you have any good practices to share, because these uh, attacks are much more difficult to detect at the beginning. So I don't know whether you could share some of your experience. Well, that attack is basically uh, uh, the carpet, that's the carpet bomb uh, uh, attack. There's very, very little traffic up to a certain destination. And what do we do in this case? Well, the first thing that we do is we try to understand the network. And to do so, to listen to the flow, we have to listen to the flow. We have to know what the standard of each IP of slash 32 in a network is, and when that happens, when there is a low rate uh, attack, that's a very low rate, 300, 400 packets per second, unfortunately, um, well, no, uh, fortunately, we can detect it, but it's very difficult to mitigate. It's easy to de mitigate because it's easy to detect because there's a standard in those IPs, but it's more difficult to mitigate it. We don't have a mitigation, but we request to increase the resources in the server. And what we do have is standard filters for that type of attack. We are aware that that server doesn't use certain protocols for using the trap. But when you have a port that is ready, for example, 1,000 packets per second, this goes to a legal port, and that is where you have the problem. So we there managed to identify this based on the explanation I sh have just shared with you. So we managed to understand the network, to have standards defined for that network, but mitigation is basically done with geographical boundaries for the packets. Thank you, Junior, for your great presentation and the challenges for ISPs under DDoS attacks. The next presentation